It is doing something. We're on. Hello, welcome back. Episode two of the Creative Practitioner podcast. I'm here with Paul. Hello. As normal. And we said at the end of the last episode, we're going to focus on uh, portfolio careers today. Mm. It's something I have developed for myself and something we talk about in the book as actually being quite a positive way for a, an artist to develop themselves professionally. Yeah. Um, you you probably have a more formal understanding than I do. What to you is a portfolio career? I think it's um, an acknowledgement and the ability to do more than one thing to earn a living. Is that a necessity in today's creative industries? I think so. Yeah. I think, um, I, I mean, I well, I, I've had conversations with university lecturers where they talk to their music performance uh, students and almost tell them that you will need to teach. This is, this is what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. I remember early on when I was coming to you for lessons, um, in fact, if you remember, I came to you and I said, I want you to get me my grade eight because I want to, I want to do it professionally. Yeah. And that was a, that was something I felt I needed to do for myself, which we've, we've talked about qualifications a little bit and I'm sure we will do again, but yeah. nevertheless, and over the course of that relationship, you were saying to me things like, you need to understand what making it means mm. and to understand when you have made it, even if you don't feel like it corresponds with what you had in your mind. Because I think, you know, if we take you and I work in the music industry. Yeah. um, And I'm sure it applies across the board in a lot of creative industries. For me, making it meant essentially being a rock star. Me too. Yeah. It it meant getting the big gigs, touring the world, playing on the big stages and somehow assuming there'd be money to pay for it all. And It's dangerous though, because because I was the same. I, I... I uh, in the in the eighties, I used to I just used to daydream yeah. uh, about being a rock star. But if I follow that through to twenty twenty four, well, I failed then, haven't I? Well, we should we should probably clarify, I guess, from the outset that that's okay. It's okay to daydream, right? We, we've got to have full time dream. Got to have the dreams and the visions. Yeah. But I I've given talks at schools and things about what I do, mm-hmm. and the thing I always open with is the reality of doing it day to day doesn't match the idea you've probably got in your mind. Certainly didn't for me. And it won't for anyone that you aspire to be like Mm. on social media. You're just seeing the presentation. Yeah, you're seeing the art. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think I said at the end of the last episode, kind of developed my own portfolio career quite organically without even realizing I was doing it at one stage. Yeah. Um, for that very reason, it's something born of necessity, isn't it? Because you can you can crunch the numbers. If I'm getting paid X amount for a gig, I need X amount of gigs per month mm. to pay for my whatever that may be, rent, mortgage, utilities, food, mm-hmm. transport, etc. Well, that's a lot of gigs, yeah. especially at the sort of fees that young, inexperienced musicians can command. Yeah. So as you said, teaching can be a really good way to tick a lot of boxes and give you a much more stable income. Do you think if we just stick to musicians just very briefly, although I'm sure the the concept would apply, what if there's someone listening to this and they really don't want to teach? Is teaching just an example? It is an example. Just an example. I I, I tell you for why. One of the things I was listening, uh, thinking about when I was listening to you was you can do anything in life creatively. Mm. We talk about this, I think, in the professionalization bit, where, whereby uh, if you're if you're a youngster working in a bar three or four days a week that takes away all the financial worries that enables you to practice your art, right? Then you are a success. Yeah, that was something I was alluding to earlier. You said something to me like, "If you are paying your bills at the end of the month and you've done nothing but work related to drumming. Yeah. That is a big success. Yeah, and there's a couple of there's a couple of people I'm going to draw on. We talk we certainly talk about this this person in, in our book. People should go and look at the work of Dan Pink. Right. He talks about mastery, autonomy mm-hmm. and purpose. But to have that, you have to take away the worry of money. 
So let's just assume we're, we're paying the bills. Yeah. Then you can practice your art. Yeah, yeah. But you don't need to be exclusive in any of it. Right. You can have a portfolio. Right. In, in an effort to chase the dream, I, I, I spent 20 years going to Los Angeles. Yeah. You know that. Right. Like the Nam show and places yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then going back outside of the Nam show at different times. Right. Right. Twenty years. Yeah. How many out of work actors do you think that I've met <laughs> who are waitering? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I mean, it's a scary thought, isn't it? Yeah. But this is this is what puts people off from trying. Yeah. Because there's this conception possibly a misconception that if you don't make it you're going to be nothing oh i mean well first of all life is a process it's a journey art is a process art is a journey yeah yeah there is no there there is no failure that you know the fear of failure is greater yeah. than the desire to succeed yeah yeah and then also imagine this imagine imagine how many times i've i've had conversations where a little person comes in for lessons and then little person enjoys it mm. and little person then becomes big person yeah and says to parents i want to do this for a living mm. and they go oh no the horror oh no 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 you can't do that the shock and it's like but hang on you you made me go when i was three yeah yeah you put me in lessons yeah and yeah. now i enjoy it yeah what, what what do you mean kind of relegates the arts to a hobby yeah and actually i think that's a shame I think life is rich. I think if you were to take a real step back and look at life, I don't think I don't think that there is a job for life anymore. I don't think there's a need for a job for life anymore. Mm. Life itself is a portfolio. We don't need to be defined by it. No. So so if you wish to be defined as a creative, nobody need know what you do to facilitate that. Mm. You're not going to put that on social media, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> three shifts at the point of three. three. <laughs> great. But, like, th- th- that's great. Like, that's genuinely ad- great, because you're, you're facilitating your your art. And But there's a lot of pride in, in going to work. There's like, there's, there's so much yeah. to take from it. Yeah. So I guess that, that was a big lesson for me as an up-and-comer, because in the early years, I wasn't making much money wasn't getting much work, wasn't getting many gigs, and the gigs I did get didn't pay very well. It's a very demoralising place to be. And I, I, I was quite lucky. I won't, I won't bore you with my personal story, but I got married quite early, managed to, with, you know, with help, buy a house yeah. quite early. And I have never not been able to contribute my share of the bills, which is something I'm very pleased about. And I've, I've never earned a penny that's not from drumming in some capacity or another. Even if even if I've not earned enough to have any disposable income or put anything in a pension or any of that nice financial independence that we talk about, even when mm. I wasn't able to do that, I was still able to at least contribute my share of the bills. And I think to get the perspective that that is success and that is making it and anything above that is a bonus was a big kind of kick up the backside to keep going. Well, that, that comes around to the other person that, you know, um, this is music centric, drummer centric, really. But um, I remember having a chat with Vic Firth, uh, the man. The man the, himself. The man himself. And, you know, Vic was really kind. Uh, and, like, he just was a kind yeah. man. Yeah. Uh, I did meet him once yeah. in Frankfurt. Yeah. So I, I was having a chat with him and uh explained where i was from where i lived and then he has asked me uh how far away that was from london and did i have any aspirations to go to london and i said no but the the, the person next to me said yes so he said then to this person well where are you from and i think he said king's lynn so we had we had to explain to me (laughs) what you know what what, that was what that was was. (laughs) yeah um and he said, and this this resonates with me. I mean, this must be twenty five years ago, by the way. This yeah. conversation, and he and he said to this kid, "Forget London; it will just swallow you. It will yeah. consume you. It will spit you out." Yeah, you know. He said, "Become a local kingpin." Yeah, if you yeah. can earn a living where you you live, yeah. you're from. Yeah, you've made it. Yeah, 
you know, and I've said that to you actually, uh, out of context, I've said that to you about your lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, and then, you know, it, mine similar to yours in that I, I turned professional when I was 18, yeah. whatever, whatever that term means. Yeah. But I did. Yeah. And I've, uh, until extremely recently, I've, I've not, um, and this is interesting by the way, I've not made a penny outside of the arts until really, really recently. And I'm delighted and proud to say that I do now have work outside, work of, outside the of the arts. You're heathen. Yeah. How dare you? How dare I? We are defined by our art form. But like, like I had this conversation with myself. Like it was, it was during the pandemic where it's like, I want to learn how to tailor a suit. Yeah. I want, I want to go to Italy and make pizza. Yeah. 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 I want to, yeah, I've told you this. Like there's so many things. Life's so rich. Life is the portfolio. So is it right for me to limit what I do? Mm. Might be. There's a pride. There's a pride, isn't there? Rightly or wrongly in saying I am a, in my case, drummer, or I am an artist, or I am a dancer, or I am a photographer. So that then becomes this, self-sustaining cycle of well i have to be that identity is important yeah but it's it's also a double-edged sword isn't it because we need to be able to say well at the moment maybe i can't make a living from being just a drummer and it's okay if i need to take a shift doing this or i need to expand and do this just to survive it is more than okay to do that yeah that's that's still hard for me to think about because I've never needed to do that touch wood. Maybe one day when I knew, do need to do that, it's something I will need to accept because of this identity. I've identified as, and this is the interesting part which we've talked about with mutual friends, I don't just identify as a drummer, I identify as a professional drummer. And that brings with it the weight on Atlas's shoulders that I must therefore remain as a professional drummer or else I've failed. But you can't not be, is my argument. Yeah. 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 You, you will be forever. Yeah. Because it's an attitude. It's not a paycheck. But it's it's difficult when you're in the heart, when you're in the midst of it, it's difficult to separate those two, isn't it? And that's why you need to collaborate. Yeah. You one day you might need a solicitor, one day you might need an accountant, one day you might need a mortgage broker, you might need yeah. a mechanic. Yeah. You might yeah. you can't do it all on your no, own. No, no, no. I'll give um the, the example we give in the book, I can't even remember the name of the person we, we used. I think it was, I can't even remember the name we used for the example portfolio person. But I, I actually based it on myself. In the in the book, they're a guitarist. Yeah. In in reality, he is a drummer. Here he is. But <laughs> it, was, it was one of those chapters you gave me kind of free reign to go ahead with. Mm. Because, as we've said, it's it's what I do. Yeah. and found myself doing and it's a fascinating way to find yourself living because the general cycle for me it doesn't matter where you start in the circle so let's let's say i produce an educational video yeah and i i talk for 20 minutes on this video about a particular drumming technique and the video becomes a little bit popular so i do a follow up and then i do a follow up and then eventually i think actually i'm i'm doing well with this I'm going to write a bit of a piece about it. Maybe I write an article on my website or yeah. even I write a book. Yeah. So I then I then produce this educational document, let's just say, let's just call it a book. And then I sell the book and I sell the book to someone and they say, oh, I want to learn how to do this. So I'm going to book you a lesson. So they come to me to have a lesson. Yeah. And then off the back of one element of my, let's say, teaching, I've got views on a video, I've sold a book and I've got a new student. So I've I've kind of got three income streams from one from one element. But then you can you can flip that and you can have lots of different elements all feeding into one income stream because if there's different books on different topics that are linked to that main one. Yeah. So I I, I can't remember now. I think as is book t- eleven or twelve for me that I've published. Yeah, it's number eight for me. Number eight. I mean, you you understand the thread that runs through all of obviously this one's the least instrument centric that both of us have done i think you've done another one about ergonomics but yeah your your five is it five of the drum set books you've done yeah there's a there's a there's a thread that's you running throughout the way you teach the way you talk about things yeah i think this is the defining character of that approach 
it's recognizing a diverse skill set in being able to bring those to bear on a common goal, which is, of course, to make a living. If that's the goal. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm coming to this from, a, from somebody who does this for a living. So, yeah. you know, I need to sustain myself. But nevertheless, to be a, a realized artist, professional or not, you, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to say you can't do it, just focusing purely on the discipline itself. There's so much more to it, isn't there, mm. than just the act of painting the picture. Yeah, there's a need, isn't there, to develop secondary skills. Yeah. Um, so podcasting, videography, think about what you, you know. Typesetting. Yeah, publishing. Yeah, copying. How do you get it on Amazon? Yeah. You know, they, these are all secondary skills that and that that help the primary skill. Yeah. The primary art. They all supplement it, don't they? Yeah. And you can't have any of it without the other if the goal is to make a living. Does that need to be the goal for an artist to fully realise their art form? What's that? Sorry? Well, you know, you, you say if the goal is to make a living. Do you think there's this perception that in order to take an art form to the highest level, you have to do it professionally? No. And, and therefore you have to do it professionally if you want to do it to the highest level. What's highest level mean? Well, sure. I mean, that's a that's a big topic. But there might be people listening to this who are doing an art as a hobby and they've got, a, a you know, another source of income. So they're not reliant on their art for money, mm -hmm. which is nice. That's a nice place to be. But they may also feel a frustration that because their time and energy is part of the time taken up by work they can't commit themselves to their art form as much as they would like and therefore they're always going to be quote unquote a hobbyist i think there needs to be a change of language that's the the first the first point is that participation is really important competency is less important right so how good you are doesn't validate you yeah. as an artist identify yourself as an artist mm. I'm a drummer. Mm. Great. Does it, it doesn't need to be how good are you? No, and I only know that now, by mm. the way. Uh, well, uh, self-confidence uh, and imposter syndrome is a, a yeah. real beast, isn't it? Yeah, I know I can play the drums. Mm. Nobody can tell me I can't play the drums. Mm. Subjectively, whether people like that or not. Yeah, yeah. That that was a, that's big. That's that's a whole other topic. Let's not like. But but that was that was big. So, but going back to what I said is being you know, participating it's not important to be any good at this no but it is important if you're going to charge for it that you do it within convention convention yeah of norms yeah. yeah right but um but even then you don't need to be the best my first album is a, is, is almost ready as you know i do and the reason it's almost ready in uh, as i am now 50 is because I'm scared to death. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Because, it, you know, but actually the, the, the mindset that I've adopted now, this piece of work is a journal entry. Mm. This is for me. Mm. And if other people like it, I'd be delighted. But that's the but contribution, isn't it? It, it is, it is. But, but it, it, what it's done is it, it's removed all of the fear that stopped me contributing. Right. Fear of failure fear, is yeah. greater than... Is it, you and know. fear of how it's perceived. Yeah, yeah, and not being in that club. Yeah. And and all of that. And and that haunted you. It did. And it will haunt... Every, it will haunt everyone who's, who's starting out. My, my biggest advice would be to do this within a rich portfolio. Mm. The happiest people I know in the arts, they'll work with men cap on a friday doing a, a, a workshop they'll be performing at a festival or a gig on a saturday they'll be teaching for two days a week yeah then they'll be out swimming or paddleboarding or cycling or mm. like you know there's 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 no need to do any one of element of it exclusively exclusively mm. um the happiest people I know that make some of the most amazing music, you would never know that they don't do it full time. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, 
whose business is it? Yeah, that doesn't need to be a defining feature of the contribution, does no, it, of the art form? No, And also, you know, again, the older I get, I, I realise that this takes support and I realise this takes investment. There's a lot of really, you know, you do business creatively. There's a lot of creative people, actors, musicians, that that have delis, mm. burger bars, mm. And they're the most wonderful businesses, but it, it keeps them in the game. Yeah. And actually, the common denominator, the common thread through all of that is their desire to be around people. Yeah. Yeah. I want to come back to that because, and it touches on the subject of money as yeah. well, which considering we're writing and talking about creative industries, you know, there's the element of professionalization yeah. and doing it for a living. Now, we've, we've laughed before. I think it was Mel Lewis, the drummer, that said, I had to make a decision between making drums, making music or making money. Mm. So I gave up making money. You know, there's this, there's this inside joke, at least in the, in the drumming world that we're familiar with that you're never going to get rich doing it, right? It's you're in the wrong game if, unless you're going to be Ringo Starr and get yourself into a massive band, which, you know, I've never been able to do that even if I'd wanted to. So you're not in it for the riches. And it often, I often felt in my younger days, I was the poorest person in the room when you're going by the bank account. Only by the bank account. Only by the bank account. Well, this is, again, something that I've come to learn to appreciate. I mean, look at you and you and me here now. It's Friday afternoon. Yeah. And we're sitting here in a sunlit studio talking about ourselves and talking about music and talking about the industry. This morning I went to the gym. Yesterday I went to the gym. We've been out for a walk. We've had some lunch. I'll be doing a bit of teaching after this. I'm playing a show next week, but in the meantime, I've got plenty of other things. And I, I've come to realise what I value in life is that work-life balance. And I can acknowledge that I make an average income, enough to be comfortable. I'm likely never to be rich in terms of money, but I have enough time and freedom and flexibility to spend with my daughter and my family and to go to the gym on a Friday morning and to go out for a walk if I want to because I don't have office hours. And I think this freedom that can come about through something like a portfolio career does transcend the financial aspect. I think when you first start out, you probably know this as well as I do, there's a lot of emphasis on the finances. But sadly, there is in life. This well, is how it is. Right. So if I want to be, just to take my case, if I want to be a professional drummer... Mm-hmm. How much do I need to earn per month just to survive? But then that's the question, right? That's the burning question, right? How many gigs do I need? How many students do I need? But, you know, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years into doing this, that's still a factor, right? I need to earn enough money to survive. But how does achieving that affect my mental health? How does achieving that affect my work-life balance? If I'm earning £50,000 a year but I'm in the studio from eight in the morning till eight o'clock at night, six days a week. Do I want that life? That's not going to feel like... That's not going to feel like success, is it? No, no. Um, no. So, and, and I think if I go back to the very first day I met you, e- even then, your milestone for success was a product. Yes. I need a grade eight. Yes. Whereas actually... I think you're now in that that process mindset. But that's taken time. Yeah. And that's probably the biggest factor we've not talked about yet. I It's very easy for me to sit here now and wax lyrically about my work-life balance and not needing to worry about money, but I'm, I've been in the game 14 years. And that, that's no mean feat. No, but it, that, can't be, that can't be overstated because for somebody just starting out, the reality is... It does take a long time, doesn't it, to build it up from nothing? It does. I mean, you know, I in 1992, I earned 60 quid. Right. Well, quite. I mean, what what is somebody listening to this supposed to do with that, right? Because with all the goodwill in the world, even just legally getting yourself set up as a sole trader or a limited company takes time. Mm. Even just booking in your first student or getting your first gig, as good as that feels, it takes time. Building up to a steady 20 hours a week of teaching and gigging frequently or whatever else you do, or however many 
items of clothes you need to produce for your textile business or whatever it is, it takes time. Yeah. Does that, is there anything, you can't, you can't alleviate that, can you? Is there anything you can do to alleviate that? Or is that just an ever present reality of any business? I think so. I mean, there are, there are schools of thought that, that say that, you know, if you're going to set up a business, a, a, the proprietor is probably not going to get paid in the first three years. Three years. Yeah, I've heard that. One of my friends, she's retraining as a nutritionist. And she's she's got a well-paid job at a well-established multinational company. She's got good money, mm. good pension, stock options, and all these powerful things financially. But she's not happy. So she's retraining as a nutritionist, and her plan is to set up her own company and give, you know, independent consulting and things like this. Yeah. And she I won't I don't I won't disclose any figures, but she has told me, she's a mother, single mother of one, what she needs to earn to survive not to thrive not to put money in her ISA and stuff like this just to pay the bills and keep the child fed and in clothes and at school and keep the lights on in the house yeah and it's a big amount of money and she will be leaving her job after she's finished training and will be in this very difficult position where she's not going to make that amount of money in the first year and that can be a huge, that, the fear of that, we've talked about the fear of failure, but the fear of that can be enough to stop people trying. In Which is tragic. Place. It is tragic. But sometimes you, it's like, how do, you, how do you get past that? You might not be able to. You, well, need, I, you need support. You do need support. And this is what I was just going to come on to, because when I was 24 and I first started teaching with you, in yeah. fact, at West Bridgeford, I was still living with my parents. Me too when i was 18 right. 60 quid for the year right right so i was still living with my parents yeah i got married at 20 i'm trying to think now i got married at 24 about the same year i got married and my wife has always had a, a, a office job day job so she was earning good money so without that i don't know if i would be sitting here today we we got the mortgage for this place as i said in the last episode we got the mortgage for this place based on her income alone because mine was discounted. So my parents made up a shortfall in a deposit. Yeah. So I think it's naive to discount the role support plays and time. As I said, the biggest factor in my success is time. Persistence. And yes, support. Mm. You, you are the biggest factor. Yes. In your okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I know I'm... You, yeah, uh, I, 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 take, I take the point, but... I wasn't the success I am. Whatever success I am today, I wasn't it five years ago. You can you cannot fail. What what do you mean by that? Because you've said okay. you've said that before, and I know what you mean, but I want you to tell me what you mean by that. Okay. Um, let's say it all changes tomorrow, literally overnight. Yeah. And you are now working in an office. Yeah. Everything you have achieved is a success forever. It's not going away. It can't go away. Yeah. Because I can buy it. Yeah. You can sell it me forever. Yeah. You, you cannot fail. These contributions are permanent, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. And they'll, they'll outlive you. They will. No, so you cannot fail. Yeah. But, but failure and success can't be tied up with monetary. No, because... And, and that makes people very unhappy. Yeah. You know, very unhappy. Especially when we look at careers around around the arts um i wish i'd done the portfolio from day one mm. i really do i really do mm. I, I i've gone without and actually when 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 i found an mlc that was the re that was the unknowing realization of the fact that i needed a portfolio i i, I give you an, i give you an example um both of my sons have got music out available right I haven't. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Not yet. But that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Neither of them earn their main, the lion's share of, of their income from music. Yeah. But they're very happy. Yeah. Within their creative zones. Well, I think I think that's a good topic to, to finish on. The happiness. Mm. It, it's so easy... As we've said all along today, it's so easy to equate success 
financially. Now, of course, we, the part, part of the reason we're here and part of the reason we've written this book is to try to shed insight on the act of making a living, mm. a sustainable living. And me diversifying into a portfolio career, knowingly or unknowingly, ultimately served the purpose to allow me to carry on doing something that makes me happy. Making money was just a necessary thing I had to do to keep the lights on. You can never have enough money, so forget it. Yeah. If if you are driven by mastery, purpose, mm. and autonomy, yeah. but you're in a fortunate position where you don't need to worry about money, then you are then you will achieve happiness. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's got to be the goal for any art form, right? Ultimately. Yeah. Just briefly, I know you're talking about your friend retraining. Mm-hmm. Why is it that we creatives think that we don't need to retrain in order to teach? Mm. The idea of teaching as a, as a dedicated set of skills. That's got nothing to do with your ability to create art. Yeah, we've talked about the disconnect between being able to do the art and then communicate that. Yeah. Episode three then. There it is. Episode three on teaching an art form. Yeah. Does that, does that have... Does that have professional connotations as well? I guess so, because there's peripatetic work, there's in institutions, there's out-of-school settings. You've got to turn up on time as well. You've got to turn up on time, the (laughs) professionalisation. There there needs to be an acceptance. You know, the creative who thinks that they don't need to conform, just good luck with that. No man's an island, as we said. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the creative practitioner is out now physically digitally kindle you can visit jonathancurtis.co.uk for more or paul you can uh for for me paulhose.com paulhose.com very good well paul thank you thank you i'll see you next time on the creative practitioner thanks for listening Mm -hmm.